So um, this is not a technical talk. I hope it's good after all the technical um, amazing talks that we've had. Um, but today I wanted to tell you a little bit about sharing our experience in running Docker at a fairly large scale, not necessarily in terms of number of nodes, and not necessarily, well certainly not as big as Google's, but um, mostly around how did we go about building a product that can cater for thousands of different workloads without knowing what those workloads are. And I think the reason I wanted to talk to you about and share this with you was that I feel that we, we know what containers are, that's why we're here, and we're interested in them, we've seen the light. But many of us will go back to our companies, to our organizations, and want to evangelize the benefits, and, and, and uh, we will get certain questions and pushbacks from operations, from other developers, from managers, from, from the business. And I think it's quite helpful if we could have some sort of idea as what those questions are going to be, how we can, we can solve them. So first thing is, um, what is the story for Cloud66 and how did we go about choosing containers as a solution that we can help our customers with? So we are a full stack container management as a service, uh, which basically means we take care of everything you need to get containers, specifically Docker in this case, uh, into production um, on any cloud provider that you want or, or your own servers under your own cloud accounts. We support about eight cloud providers and you can, you can use those. And we identified about 11 components that we had to build or pull in from other uh, great open source technologies out there to, to enable this thing. Now, to give you a little bit of this, about this idea of a scale of this, we're running about more than 2,000 applications on the platform, um, taking out the number of different environments um, for the same application. It's about 1,200 different separate um, unique workloads that we run. They are powered by about 3,000 servers, about 7,000 developers in 800 companies use it, in eight cloud providers, the usual suspects from Amazon all the way down. And collectively, it runs on uh, about 78 data centers. Now, this is not a representation of the whole scale of a single application, but I think actually the numbers, right, like 78 data centers or 3,000 servers is not interesting. What is interesting to me is the fact that we have about 1,200 different workloads and we had to build a product for that. And the things that we had to make decisions on, I think, are interesting. Before I get into why we chose containers, I'll just tell you a little bit about what we used to do before that. So um, we started the company in 2013 with a name to make it easy for developers to build full stack for web applications, mobile backends, and APIs, which basically meant anything from database all the way to load balancers. We, but about a year ago, we started to see a pattern, um, which was quite familiar with the, uh, uh, if, if you were around the time that NoSQL databases were coming around. Everybody wanted to run everything in a NoSQL database. And then after a while, there was a realization that, you know, you have your RDBMSs for a purpose, NoSQL for something, key value pairs for something else. And then the same multiple technology backend started to kind of trickle down all the way to the front end. And about a year ago, we started getting questions like, so I have an API written in Go, my mobile is served by Node.js, my front end is Rails, and I want all of it running under the same umbrella that you're providing only for, say, Rails. We looked around for technologies, and we found containers to be very useful. So why containers? I think the top reasons is something that everybody in this room should know, and I'm sure you do. The fact that they support polyglot applications, so you can put anything in the container and you don't care what's in it. It just has to adhere to certain uh, you know, specific standards and it works. It de decouples you from convoluted runtime packages. And it's very fast, much far faster than, than VMs and more efficient. You get more juice out of your box and everything else around it. Two things that were very applicable to us was what I call the group picture effect of images. So you have like these cloud providers and like, EC2, for example, you have AMI. And it's kind of like you get the, you know, all, the whole family together, like great uncles and aunts and everybody else together, and you take a group picture of this, which is your image for the VM. And then as soon as you take that picture, it starts to, starts to drift and become out of date. You know, people get hair transplants and have babies or whatever that might be. So you have to get everybody together and take another picture. Um, and it's the same with AMI. So you basically, every time it has an update to a library, your whole image gets out of date. So you have usually two ways of dealing with that. You either find yourself dealing with a nightmare of images, or you find yourself going back all the way to vanilla, 
getting the minimum image possible and then building everything every time. Apart from the speed issue, I often find that this solution doesn't work really well because at the time that you want to build, you're exposed to a lot of third-party third -party things, like the URLs might not be there, GitHub might be under attack from China, whoever knows, you know. Things, things happen exactly at the wrong time. So containers helped us well, a lot with that because you have these layers and you change an upstream layer and everything on that, um, above that doesn't change, and it's really good. But I think the most important thing that's not very obvious, and it kind of comes about about when you go to bigger organizations is the clear separation of devs and ops. When you have everything inside a container is dev, anything outside is ops. And that's great because when you deal with a full stack deployment like what we used to do, we often find ourselves going and helping customers within their code sometimes. Because business is suffering, something is down, something is slow, and you don't know whether it was the cloud provider, is it the network, is it the storage? Is it that image that's stale, or is it there's a bug in the application? The fact that we can say, if you get this container, hit it on this port, and it returns a 200, and it's good, means that we can be sure where the problem or responsibility lies. And it is, I think, it is, a, is an artifact of bigger organizations having two different separate disciplines. But when we went out to actually apply containers to our setup, we realized that we have to make a lot of decisions. And it boiled down to about 11, from which OS to use to what scheduling or orchestration engine to use, what, what about networking, you know, service discovery, and all sorts of things. I'm going to just whiz through all these 11, um, and I'm going to go a bit deeper onto about three, which is the OS vendor selection that we went through, the network solution that we chose, and the whole thing around build and traceability of developer's flow. But just this list essentially boils down to what is the OS that you want to use? Many people here before, um, before this talk talked about the orchestration and scheduling engine where you get a bunch of containers, a bunch of servers, how do they uh, you know, play out onto getting, getting where they want to get to. Network, different options that you have on network. What is service discovery as in these containers that you have are going to find each other and talk to each other. Where is actually... Um, the image, where, where, is, where is this container going to be built? Is it an artifact of test, or is it a separate set of build servers that's going to do it? What about the repository? Is it private? Is it public? What about authentication? What about ACLs, if you have any, you know, if you have any in, inbound compliance that you have to adhere to? Data and databases, essentially storage. Is it in a container, or is it outside the container? I mean, we, have, we heard both sides of this um, before, mostly people arguing for them to be inside. Um, for, for logging, we found that there are two types of logging that are very important. So developers are used to, as developers, we are used to you know, doing active logging, where you have a log file or a syslog, or like you send it to you know, log entries or whoever else, and you actively log something, and you're very clear about that. But there is another part that we found with containers that is actually very important. That's what I call like passive logging, as in the container even doesn't come up. It doesn't hit your application in the first place, and you don't know why. Is it the volume that's not mounted, it's not there? Is it the port that's being used by somebody else? All sorts of things that could go wrong. And that level of logging that you can aggregate all the, all the logs from outside the container and inside the container together to get a picture of what's happening. As well as that, if you have a proper microservices structure or, or, or deployment, a service-oriented architecture, you, hit, you get a hit from, a, say, a, a visitor to a website. It goes through Nginx. Nginx does a load balancing to a bunch of containers. This container goes from this server to another container at the back end on another server, and it goes to another one, pack, you know, dispatches out to a bunch of other servers, and then, you know, good luck finding the log for this whole distributed system without having a session ID or what, what actually weaves these things together. As for monitoring, obviously you get a lot of metrics for the host level, but what about the uh, things that you can get from containers? And are you going to go around and you know, have another container that rides along other containers to kill the ones that are getting a bit big or you know, consuming too much, too much memory or CPU? Where is load balancing? Is it inside the server or is it outside the server? Is it like the concept of pods, for example, for Kubernetes is another thing, where you have load balances around a bunch of services. And and debugging, which I found very, very interesting when it comes to containers, because the lack of logging that's actively prepared for that um, is one thing. But being able to fire up a container in an environment simulated like as if it is the production, with the network, with environment variables, with all the mounts that it has to have, so you can actually bash into that container and see 
what's going on, exactly what's going on, is, is, is an, another thing. And the difference here is that, obviously, we always discourage people from getting into an SSH and into a, into, a, into a server when it's production, because it's not immutable. You can, you know, people can go there and change something and say, oh, it's fixed. And they go home for the weekend, and nobody knows what's happened. But with containers, because they're immutable, they can, they can, um, they can, they can change. They cannot change, and if, if, if there's a change, it's going to be written by the next version. You can actually get into the container sometimes. I'm not encouraging that practice, but you can get into a container and actually see what's going on without, hopefully, breaking anything. Now, the first thing that I want to go a bit slightly deeper on, and like what decisions we made, is OS choice. So there's a bunch of operating systems that you can choose for containers. And essentially, it boils down to two types and two different places. So the two types are Docker-friendly or container-friendly operating systems and just vanilla, box standard containers, um, operating systems. The standard ones are you know, Debian, CentOS, um, Ubuntu, whatever is your weapon of choice. And then the container-friendly ones, like CoreOS, for example, one or Rancher OS, um, which one would you choose? The other thing is, where is that operating system? Is it the one that you're talking about on the host, or is it on the container? When we went out to talk to our customers about this, um, we realized that we were really pushing for a container-friendly operating system. And we went out and said, it is great, because it knows about containers. It doesn't have all that extra stuff that you don't need when you're running inside containers. And also, um, mo most important of all, you get the cycle of the release. So if you have a Docker container that requires, say, overlay FS, the upstream for that is going to have it. It's going to support it. You're going to get all the benefits and good things about it downstream. And we go out to the customers and talk to them, and they say, well, hang on a second. So you want me to use containers to fix three problems, and you want to introduce a new version of an OS, a flavor into the data center, while I have a bunch of people who know Ubuntu inside out, I have a ton of chef scripts that I've written for, for Ubuntu, and you're telling me that I need to change that. Because of that, we, we had to go with Ubuntu Snappy because it was something that people just were more comfortable with. Nothing against any other container-friendly ones. I think this trend is going to change. Um, but at the moment, this is what we are getting back from our customers. Um, the other thing is about the external. OS. We found that CentOS is pretty much the, the one that people want outside the containers uh, because they're just more comfortable with the security, I suppose. Uh, but developers prefer some sort of Debian uh, flavor. Now, the next topic is actually network, which I think is very important. Now, many people talk about network. And when networking started, it was about multiple containers running on, serving on different ports. And I think that different ports actually caused a lot of issues when it comes to service discovery and network. And the reason is this. If you use something like different multiple ports for your containers and your services, you essentially add metadata to where the, the services can be found. It's not just an IP address. It's an IP address, which is the IP address of the server. Then there's another IP address, which is the IP address of the container. And then there's the port that's, that's sitting, sitting on it. And you usually get that whole container exposed at the server level on a specific port, and you get to that, which means you need metadata. That's why systems like etsd make sense, because they can capture metadata and notify you of the change. We actually implemented etsd. We went out to customers, and they said, why do I need to change my code? Why do I need to write this API? Why do I need to write hooks to get notified about the change? And why do I need to know different ports? My API is serving on port 80. That's, and that's the end of it. So we had to go back. We had to write a DNS-based thing. And for that, we realized that we need a network that supports individual IP addresses per, per container. We chose Weave, which was, um, we found really easy to use. But at the same time, it allowed us to uh, span across multiple data centers. One trick here was this. We work with eight data centers. Each one of them have, I don't know, about between 10 to 25 data centers around the world. And oddly enough, it seems that they are written by different people. So one DigitalOcean data center is like V1, and they use like 10 range for the internal IP addresses. The other one uses 172. And in the case of Microsoft Azure, you can actually find public IP addresses used as internal ones. So one thing that we wanted to do was, what if a customer has a stack that has multiple data centers across different data, um, cloud providers? What IP range are you going to use to guarantee that there's not going to be any conflict? I think 
as long as nobody go is going to build a data center in Yorkshire in England, we're going to be fine because we chose one geographical IP address there. As well as that, we, 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 um, we use Weave and we padded that with, with the DHCP on top, they assign IP addresses, and the DNS, which I'll get into a bit um, in deeper. So that's our service discovery slash network. The containers at the bottom are connected together with Weave. Each container has its own IP address, 25 something something, which is a geographical IP address for Yorkshire. Um, we have something that we call Delphi Server and the Delphi Client. Delphi Client is a client for Delphi Server, but as well as that, it's a local DNS server. It's very much similar to Sky DNS if, you, if you're familiar with that. We connect that to the server with a 0MQ subscription, and messages are um, serialized with protobuf, which is a super cool um, communication serial serialization that doesn't have any tax. Um, our deployment engine, every time you deploy a service or the whole entire stack, will update a Redis cluster. A Redis cluster subscription publish, publishes that to Delphi server. Delphi server invalidates all the nodes, all the DNS servers there, and then you can, you can, you can request where your backend is, which basically looks like this. So if you have two types of services, web and API, and imagine that you do a deployment of the backend and a deployment of a front end. At this point, you probably have two sets of two versions of your application or two, both services in flight at the same time. Some of them are the way down, some of them are the way up. Some of them are draining, V1. They're not gonna get new traffic, but just like that file upload that was happening is going to carry on until it's finished, and the new ones are coming up. Both of them are gonna ask for the same thing, api.class66 local, which is an address that we have locally there. One of them is gonna get the IP address for v1, the other one is gonna get the IP address for v2. And that's basically it. As long as the developers are concerned, they don't have to do anything extra. They don't have to add a suffix for like v1 or v2 because they don't know which version they're running. The way we do it, we know what the IP address of the caller is obviously, when, we make it, when there's a DNS request there. We have it cached, we know what version that, uh, that is because it's bound to our deployment engine and then we just result that DNS to the right IP address. And it's all possible because we don't have ports, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to use DNS without a lot of things that, again, require code change on the, on the customer side. The next thing is about build. Well, actually, the last thing that I want to talk to you about is about building. One of the biggest things that we found as, as people who go out to customers and talk about containers and Docker is I have a bunch of developers that are very familiar and, and comfortable with doing what they're doing. You know, they write code, they put it into a good repository, and you know, there's a build system or there's a pool or whatever happens. You know, after that, goes to a CI system, and after that, you know, it gets deployed. Um, this has to change if you want to if you want to develop with uh, with containers. Where is that image built? You know, we see sometimes, scary as it is, developers build it on their own servers, on their own like Mac and then the image is there, they push it into Docker, Docker uh, Hub or their own private repository and that's how it's used. Obviously, it's not ideal, you wanna have some consistency around that. So there's a bunch of build servers that you can use or you can use Docker Hub or you can use some other system. We built something called Build Grid, which is fairly similar to this. But, but the most important thing that we found is traceability. What I mean by traceability is basically this. Numbers are not important, they're just different. So you have Git on one side with a bunch of hashes, right? One bunch of Git refs. Developers go and develop code and commit that, and you know, it's all good. Before this, you couldn't have multiple versions of your application. Before containers, you couldn't have multiple different versions of containers running on the same server, unless it was in the, in the process, which is, which is different. But if, you, if there was an issue, you could trace it back all the way to the code and see what's going on, which hash, which commit actually caused it. What's happened now is you, you have a bunch of code. It ends up in a bunch of images with their own hash. And then they go out, turn out into a bunch of you, you know, GUIDs of the containers of different versions. Now, if there's an issue, first, you have to find out which version was served. Secondly, you have to tie this all the way back from the UID of the container to the line of code that caused that issue. And it's not only the, the line of code within the code, but it could be the Docker file itself, where it wasn't the code. It was just the way it was built. So that's one of the things that we realized actually is more important than where the build is, is, is um, is, 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 is happening, and that is a traceability of the whole thing. So I think if, if, we, on, if, if we go back and we want to implement Docker, I think one of the th important things that we have to find out is a traceability and accountability as to where things are happening. 
The devs and off split is another thing that we found to be very interesting. So going back to the PaaS, or public PaaS days when essentially ops guys were ignored as if they don't exist, um, which I think was the downfall of probably public PaaS in my opinion. Um, what we found is um, any solution that's going to work in a, in, a, in a slightly larger enterprise has to be, has to acknowledge and cater for ops in a totally separate way. That's not forced by developers. Developers, you know, I'm a developer, I love writing code, but I know at some point when my organization gets to a certain size, ops guys are going to come in and, like, and say, you know, this is about keeping the lights on, you cannot just push code into Git and it just automatically happens to go to production. And because of that, what we had to do, what we had to essentially split the way is it I think it's kind of visible the way we define an application split it from the way it's actually deployed so this is what we call a services YAML which is very much similar to compose um, we did before compose so it's not backward compatible or forward compatible um, but basically, it's very similar. So you say where my Git is, and it goes to your build grid and builds it. Where's my source code? What command do you want to run? If it is not inside um, your Docker file, at every deploy, you want to run something. The ports, which is the internal port, HTTP port, HTTPS port. And this one is only an internal point, so it's not externally publicly available. If you want to stop, how are you going to say what's the sequence to drain a container, for example? So send the USR2 and wait for one minute and then 30 seconds, USR1, and then probably after that, just kill it forcefully. You can define health checks, for example, and say, hit this at port, uh, in this case, 3,000. If you get a 200, within 45 seconds on HTTP at this URL, then it's healthy so you can come online. It's kind of like blue-green for the poor. And then you have the back end where you have, this time it's an image, so you can bring your own image if you want. And it, it requires web, so it waits for web to come up and then starts. As you can see, we keep databases outside containers for now. And Luke's going to hate me now, but, um, so, but we keep databases outside the containers, and this is how you define it. So we can get this on your laptop and run it there as well. And this is what we call manifest file, which is for the ops guys. Hopefully it's not as small as this. But in this case, what we're saying is, I'm running on Amazon, and I'm running on a VPC, for example. This is the idea of my VPC. Root disk size always has to be 100. I think it's gigabytes. Um, keep five images, and on every box, install an extra package. And that separation seems to be very important for, for our customers when we go out to them. They really like the fact that there are two different files controlled by two different people in two different repositories with two different permission sets. I think those are the things that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, obviously, this is not a technical talk. It wasn't, I'm not even in the caliber of many of the speakers and many of the audience here, so I'm not going to even try to pretend that I know what I'm talking about. Um, but we usually, or not me, but our team usually blogs in, details about, in detail about what we do, how we do it, why we get to the conclusion, and, and make a decision. It's on blogcloud26.com. You can always have a look. and. You know, if you want to have any, if you have any questions, you want to talk about any of these um, topics that I talked to you about, please feel free to come and chat. Thank you. <laughs>